Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Dr. Sophie Wariski, veterinarian at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. Today, we're gonna to talk about monk seals. So let's get into it. What kind of work does the Pacific Marine Mammal Center do? So the Marine Mammal Center um, operates the largest marine mammal rehabilitation hospital in the world. And we're primarily located in California, but we do have a facility here on the big island of Hawaii as well. Um, and we have over 40 years of experience now in caring for a variety of marine mammal species. And we were the organization was started by a small group of dedicated and passionate volunteers that wanted to make an impact on marine mammal health and to help animals in need. And we've grown significantly since then. Our Hawaii hospital was opened in 2014 and it was purpose built to care for Hawaiian monk seals specifically. Can you show us some pictures, Mike, of the facility and maybe Dr. Whiskey can uh, let us know what each picture is of? Yeah, so this is a picture of our animal care facility. This is where we can house monk seals um, that are presented to us for a variety of different uh, reasons, but primarily they come to us needing care. Um, for different diseases or injuries, and they can stay in this area. So this is one of our pools, um, and they have a lot of haul out space and, and some area to rest, but also a pool that they can swim in and get some exercise. And it's all completely covered, affectionately known as the burrito. Um, we're located very close to the airport. So if you're looking down and see something that looks vaguely like a burrito, that's us. Again, this is just another shot of inside that animal care facility where we bring Hawaiian monk seals from across the, across the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, so we are the only facility that's permitted by NOAA for long-term care of, of Hawaiian monk seals specifically. So we will get animals from all of the Hawaiian islands um, wow. that come to us for care. <laughs> this is one of our lovely patients. <laughs> <laughs> You can see they're, they're very endearing and um, they wiggle their way right into your heart very quickly. So <laughs> this is a, a photo of an animal coming or getting a physical exam. So every animal that's brought to us, we do a full workup. Um, so in general, when an animal is identified as needing care, we have an idea of what might be going on with that animal. There's a reason that we're going to rescue that animal and bring them in to evaluate them. But once they do get here, we do a full comprehensive physical, very much like an annual physical exam that a person would get, um, just to check them over, make sure there are other underlying conditions in addition to the primary reason um, that they've come to us for care. And you can see this is a couple of our dedicated volunteers uh, working with one of our Hawaiian monk seal patients. As a nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on a dedicated core of volunteers that come in um, and they do both animal care as well as response. And um, this is a, a photo of one of or a group of our volunteers going in and just gently moving one of our animals from a pen, one pen to another so that we can clean that space. We work very hard to just interact in a minimal way. So you can see these crowding boards help us to both keep our volunteers safe, but also to kind of interrupt that human form um, and create a little bit of distance between us and those animals. They are wild animals, so we are very careful in the way that we interact with them. So I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. I was wondering with the volunteers, I know you guys are having a volunteer drive, but I think this will air afterward, but can people still, after the volunteer drive, decide they want to volunteer? Yes. How does it work? And we have recruitment um, periods throughout the year. So just because this volunteer drive is, is ending soon, um, there will be others throughout the year. We encourage you to check the website, um, the Marine Mammal Center .org. Uh, Check Check us out there and just see if there's a volunteer drive going on. We love recruiting and welcoming new um, members to the, the Marine Mammal Center Ohana. Um, and we are always looking for, for folks to help us in this really important mission. How about in other islands? I mean, I know you guys are located on the big island, but say somebody wanted to volunteer on Oahu or Kauai or another island, would that be possible? Absolutely, that's a great question. And our organization, the Marine Mammal Center is 
um, just preparing to um, start coordinating response on Maui Island. So we are expanding over there and we are looking for volunteers there. So please do again, check out our website, marinemammalcenter.org to see if you can come and help us either on the big island or on Maui. Um, and then we do work with other partner organizations throughout the main Hawaiian islands that are doing similar work. So each island has an organization that you can volunteer with and we encourage you to check them out too. They're all wonderful partners helping in this same um, mission to help conserve Hawaiian monk seals. And what kind of training do the volunteers have to go through and what do the what kind of things do the volunteers actually help with? Yeah, uh, so we have two primary uh, core groups of volunteers. One is focused on animal care, and those are the ones that are here working in our hospital. And um, they help us to care for any of the sick or injured animals that come to us. So um, primarily helping us feed those monk seals, making sure they're getting their medications, um, conducting observations to make sure that uh, we're not seeing any strange behaviors or, or things like that and providing them with enrichment items to kind of stimulate their natural thinking and natural feeding processes. Um, and then we also have a group of volunteers that conducts response and a lot of what that is, is public outreach. So we're asking these volunteers to go out and whenever we get a, a report of a Hawaiian monk seal that's hauled out, those volunteers go and they establish a a seal awareness zone around that seal. So they, they put up signs and they hang out with that seal and just educate members of the public, um, both from Hawaii or um, visiting tourists to be able to just share a little bit of information about monk seals and also to help protect and make sure that those monk seals are getting the rest that they need and making sure that folks don't get too, too close. So if somebody does get close to a monk seal, what can happen to them? So monk seal, happened to the monk seal, I should say. Yeah. It, it's both. It's both. Um, so monk seals are wild animals, and any wild animal, if it feels threatened, can certainly um, present a risk to a human that gets too close. So they can bite. They do carry some nasty bacteria in their mouth that could potentially cause an infection. So certainly it's important for us to keep our distance from a human safety perspective, but it's also very important for us to keep our distance for those monk seals because when they're hauled out, that's an important rest time for them. So they have to spend a significant amount of energy foraging and getting the nutrition that they need on a daily basis. When they're hauled out, that's their rest time. And the more we disturb them, the more we're going to interrupt that rest and um, that can, you know, lower their fitness and their, their overall well-being. Um, and it's especially important for mothers and pups. So if you have a mother and pup, she's going to be hauled out taking care of that pup. And more disturbance can disrupt that bond, disrupt important nursing periods, um, which is really critical. And that's a critical time period for that pup to really be able to grow um, and get ready for life on its own in the wild. So especially with mother and pups, but all monk seals, we certainly want folks to keep their distance so that they can get their, their much needed rest. So when you say hauled out, is that something they do every day or what exactly does that mean hauled out? Yeah, hauled out um, means just laying on the beach, sunbathing is the closest thing that, that we would equate it to. Um, so monk seals will spend hours at a time um, hauled out, not necessarily every day, but often every day they have a period of rest where they're just relaxing on the beach, sleeping in the sand, sometimes sleeping on lava rocks and it looks horribly uncomfortable to us, but they seem perfectly uncomfortable or perfectly comfortable uh, just hanging out in that space. They do blend in very well with the lava rock as well. So if you're out there, uh, you know, just be, be aware that those monk seals can be out there and uh, and you can come up on one very quickly all of a sudden. So just make sure to take a step back if you encounter one. Uh, so sorry, I guess I interrupted the picture showing. So let's go back to the pictures, Mike, and we'll show the other pictures. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so this is a photo of a transport. Um, so again, I mentioned we get Hawaiian monk seals coming to us from all of the Hawaiian islands. And we partner very closely with NOAA Fisheries, but also the US Coast Guard. Um, they have been the ones that have carried the heavy lift in terms of being able to transport animals between islands. Um, so often we'll get um, we'll partner with them to fly the monk seals um, from whichever island they, they've stranded on to, here, to us here in Kona. Um, BSU 130, so we're, we're very grateful for that partnership as it allows us to really expand our, our care for these animals. Mm -hmm. 
again, another photo of transport. So you can see monk sales are quite heavy. So we need a fair <laughs> number of people to get How them heavy are they? trucks. Um, as adults, they can be you know, three, 400 pounds, wow. uh, 600 pounds. <laughs> we do have one adult female here on the big island that we estimate is about 800 pounds. Oh my gosh. Um, she's <laughs> unusually large, but um, they can get very, very big. <laughs> so <laughs> certainly need some assistance getting them in and out of our, our vehicles and then in and out of planes. <laughs> All right, so this is an example uh, of that seal awareness zone. So um, when we have a monk seal holdout like this, so resting on the beach, uh, relaxing near the shore, um, we'll place these signs at an appropriate distance to, to kind of notify members of the public um, that there's a monk seal resting in this space and to please you know, keep your distance and allow them to have that safe space. And here's a wonderful action shot of our youth and school programs um, manager, Wendy. And she is um, a wonderful part of our team. We do have education programs um, that reach middle school students to try to share um, more about those, um, the Hawaiian monk seal um, cause. And again, I encourage you to get back to our website. We have some wonderful resources there that are available to teachers, um, some virtual and online resources that people can use to help share those stories. So I encourage you to get in touch. And here's a photo of a young monk seal pup hiding in the rocks so you can see how well <laughs> they blend in. <laughs> So why don't we play that vocalization right now? And if you could tell us about vocalizations and if they do that at a young age, do they communicate with all the different other seals in the water? Is it mostly among families? So uh, as you can hear, that's a, a barking sound, and we often hear that with our younger animals, especially. Um, but any any monk seal can make that barking sound as a warning um, to get don't get too too close. They also make a really interesting whooping sound that I don't think we actually have recorded. Um, similar sorts of stories, and in general, monk seals tend to be relatively solitary, so you don't necessarily hear them talking back and forth. They're not like a California sea lion where you see a lot of interaction, a lot of barking. Mm -hmm. Um, monk seals tend to be a little bit more solitary, but when you have younger animals, especially the juveniles interacting, even with adults, you'll hear those vocalizations a lot more. So these uh, monk seals, they're solitary from their whole life after they're weaned, essentially? For the most part. And you'll see them in similar areas and you will see occasionally individuals interacting, but they don't have um, like close social groups where they hang out um, or haul out together for extended periods of time, they will interact, but it's more of a solitary lifestyle. And I guess for our viewers, and just for a reminder for myself, how can you tell the difference between a seal and a sea lion? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so seals tend to have a lower profile on the beach, uh, whereas a sea lion has these big, strong front flippers and a pelvis that can actually rotate up underneath them. So the sea lions, um, you can actually see kind of walking on land. They'll get up on those front flippers and they have that taller profile and a long neck and they walk around. Um, whereas a monk seal or any of the other true seals, they do something called galumping, which is... <laughs> as awkward as it sounds. Uh, so they're inchworming along the beach. So it's a, um, a different kind of movement, a different kind of motion, much lower profile. And um, one of the easiest things to look for is if you look at a seal's face versus a sea lion's face, sea lions have ear flaps. So you'll see actually an extended ear flap that comes out from the sides of their head, whereas true seals don't have those. So it's all a smooth profile. So that's one of the the key things that you can look for when trying to identify a sea lion versus a seal. Do we have sea lions in Hawaii or do we only have seals? We do not. We only have the Hawaiian monk seal. It's the only oh, endemic um, pinniped or, or seal or sea lion species here. But occasionally you will get a wayward um, sea lion that can potentially make its way over here. So um, there was one a, a few years ago that made its way over, but very, very unusual. They don't live here naturally. And I'm wondering, with the monk seals being endangered, what were the main factors driving that? 
and the decrease in populations, if you could talk about that. Yeah, so they were um, hunted down to the to the brink of the population. So very much a human pressure um, that that dropped that population down. And then that created a, you know, a genetic bottleneck and they created this small population that had a harder time recovering from the impacts of, of, the, of, of hunting. Um, and now they face a number of different threats. They're not being hunted, of course, they are endangered, so they are a protected species. Um, but here in the main Hawaiian islands, they still face a significant number of threats that are um, related to human activities. So in interactions with fishing gear, um, as well as a disease called toxoplasmosis that spread from domestic cats. So again, something that we brought over. Um, and of course, um, climate change is another impact that, that we're having on the planet that is causing trouble or causing difficulties in that population being able to recover. So how does climate change cause difficulties in seals being able to recover? Is it their food that they're not able to get? It could potentially be the food. Um, the impact that we're seeing, at least the most right now within the Hawaiian archipelago is in the northwestern Hawaiian islands. So some of those more isolated areas where um, some of those islands are really just you know, sand spits, um, but they're important rookery spaces. So the spaces where mothers will go to have their pups. And as sea levels rise, and as we get more and more frequent storms, you get more erosion of those areas. So there's less um, safe space for those animals to have their pups. So it, we both don't have space for those pups to be born, but it also makes them more vulnerable to predators like sharks because they're closer to the water's edge and will venture in a little bit more or could get washed off by a wave um, and get picked off by a shark. So, Jeez, how about the, I always wondered with the toxo because I don't think that seals are in close proximity to cats, but maybe the cats are pooping on the beach. Is that how the seals get the toxo? Yeah, so that's a great question. We don't know exactly what the route of transmission is, but because there are so many feral cats, um, there is a significant amount of cat feces around. And whenever there's winter storms or rains coming through, that can get washed down into the coastal environment. We do see that with sea otters in California. That's the suspected um, route of that parasite making it into their ocean home. And then um, it doesn't take very many of that particular parasite to cause an infection within an animal. So that we think that's where they're encountering it is really likely um, to be coming from rainwater runoff. Oh, geez. And how about uh, the, does it affect the brain? Is that the main thing, the toxo? Yeah, so um, it can impact the brain like in humans um, and other animal species, but in monk seals, because they haven't evolved with this particular parasite mm -hmm. um, called a protozoal parasite, um, they actually have a very systemic reaction to it. So it gets into different organ systems, multiple organ systems, um, and causes really significant inflammation. Um, and it, uh, they have a very poor prognosis, unfortunately. They don't have the capacity or the immunity to be able to deal with that particular parasite. And it often leads to death of that animal if they've encountered it. So if you were able to catch a monk seal that had toxo in time, that it looked distressed or whatever, the, you know, someone alerted, it's brought into the center, would you be able to give the animal treatment for toxo, like we give humans treatment for toxo? We can treat for toxo. Um, mo the majority of the cases that have kind of stranded with toxo have unfortunately died within the first few days of their stranding, so really no significant treatment was able to be administered. We have had two patients that have come in in the last two years that were with us for about six weeks of treatment. But again, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to knock back that inflammation enough to, um, to be able to save those two individuals. It is something that we are um, exploring and trying to develop new ways of treating, trying to talk within our community um, to get new ideas of how we can potentially combat some of that inflammation and have a better outcome for those animals. I mean, I guess maybe if they just, uh, you know, if there was some kind of program that went around, probably there is, that they go around and they neuter these cats or spay them, and then they can't reproduce. So Because there's so many in Oahu and on the other islands, that's part of the problem. So I don't, I mean, I think there's a program like that, but I do want to talk about the fishing gear and how people mm -hmm. can 
prevent that, you know, there's also other plastic, I'm sure that the seals are being may maybe eating and everything. So I did want you to talk a little bit about that, because I think that's something that humans really can do to, you know, try to prevent these seals from being caught in their fishing gear. It seems so logical just to not throw your fishing gear in the water. So I don't know if you can talk about that. What kind of things can happen to seals with the fishing gear? I know they get yeah. entangled, they can eat it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, just like you said, there's different ways that those animals can interact with that fishing gear um, and have it cause harm or um, be life-threatening. So one of those is entanglement um, and certainly proper disposal of fishing gear is really, really important. Um, and not just fishing gear, any kind of ocean trash they can get we see entanglements with things like packing straps, things like that. So even just yeah. making sure that you cut that packing strap so that it doesn't have an encircling loop mm -hmm. um, and disposing of it properly. Those are all important steps that we can take to make sure that that doesn't cause any a detriment to a marine animal or any animal. Um, and then fishing gear, you know, like, like people, monk seals will sometimes take advantage of an easy meal. So if they see a fish on a line, they may come towards your line. If you see a monk seal, you know, approaching a fishing line, certainly try to reel it in if you can. If you do have an animal that takes your fish and potentially ingests your hook, we, we strongly encourage folks to report that to the NOAA Stranding Hotline. Um, it's not to penalize anyone in any way. It's to know that, that, that there's a monk seal out there with possibly an ingested hook so that our teams can be ready to respond because there are things that we can do um, to mitigate those sorts of interactions. And um, other things include using barbless hooks, because if they do ingest it, that'll cause less drama to any yeah. of those animals. So there's lots of little steps that we can take um, to, to help protect those animals. And certainly if you see a monk seal in the area, if you can um, choose a different fishing spot, all, all those little steps. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering about what's been going on in Molokai. I don't know if there's any more light as to how these monk seals were killed there or did they, what happened? I don't know if you could shed some light on that. Um, I don't have much to share. So those are active ongoing investigations. So it's not something that, that our organization is really primarily responsible for. So we certainly do support the network as much as we can, but I don't have a whole lot of information to share there. Mm -hmm. And then I'm wondering, just out of curiosity, how you got into taking care of these marine animals. It seems like a fascinating job, but did you decide, did you know when you became a vet, this, this is what you wanted to do or what happened? Um, <laughs> yeah, I was pretty fortunate. I didn't necessarily know that monk seals were the were the animal that I wanted to work on and only that animal. Um, but I did always want to be involved in ocean conservation. I had a father who was a marine biologist, so I caught the bug early. Um, and then just throughout life loved working with animals and wanted to become a veterinarian. And, and there's mm -hmm. fortunately a way to kind of marry those two things. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> the animals, when they're born, I just uh, wanted to go through sort of their whole life cycle. They, they kind of breastfeed for about six months. Is that true? And then they're weaned and they're solitary. And how long do they usually live for? Here in the so whole it's a little bit shorter of a nursing period, actually. It's about oh, six really? to eight weeks. Yeah, okay. so they don't get as much maternal care. Um, but same thing, they, their mothers have a very high percentage um, of fat within that milk, so they gain weight very quickly. And then um, they're left to their own devices after that six to eight week period. And they typically spend about a month on the beach kind of figuring out how to forage on their own, get better at swimming, and then they're, they're, they're off. Um, and then they can live to be about 25 to 30 years old. Wow. Does that usually happen here? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what percentage of the population lives to that age. How do you know how old the monk seal is? Is there any way for you to know when the monk seal comes in, how old it is? You can just have an estimation or... Yeah, we actually know a fair amount about the monk seal population here, and that's largely because of um, the Hawaiian Monk Seal Research Program, which is a part of NOAA Fisheries. They have been um, monitoring this population for several decades and have been able to tag nearly every individual, not everyone. I mean, you can't always catch everyone when they're pups, but they've been able to tag a lot of the pups as they've been born over the years. So we have a lot of information about 
individual animals here. And especially within the main Hawaiian islands, because there are folks here and we do have these organizations like the Marine Mammal Center that you know, respond to calls of monk seals. We have been collecting data over the years about where those monk seals like to spend their time, who's spending their time where, and who's potentially interacting with who. So we have uh, a pretty good amount of information about monk seals compared to a lot of other um, seal populations. And how long do the, uh, um, I'm just wondering with the monk seals, um, how many are there? in the Hawaiian Islands right now? Yeah, so there's roughly 1,400 monk seals um, alive today. And the majority of those monk seals actually live in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So about 1,100 um, animals are in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And then within the main Hawaiian Islands, we have about three to 400 monk seals that live here. Wow, this has been a great episode. I mean, I feel like I'd love to have you on again. <laughs> so much information, but we're out, of time. <laughs> yeah, we're out of time and we'll have to wrap it up now. Okay. But I wanted to just say, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Dr. Sophie Wariski at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. Thank you for all being here. Thank you, Mike, for our engineering our session and the rest of the crew at think tech for hosting our show and thanks to you our listeners for listening i'll see you on april 28th for more of healthy planet on think tech the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet our next show will be about dogs going vegan featuring a member of the v-dog team if you have ideas for the show please contact me at healthy planet thinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.